Welcome to the Live Theatre League Legacy Project. Um, I am Lisa Dalton, the president of the League, and the League is dedicated to fostering a strong and healthy theatre scene in our community. We do this by creating a culture of congeniality and cooperation and collaboration among 15 to 20 producing companies and a host of individual leaders in the area arts. The Legacy Project is devoted to capturing the personalities and the evolution of our live theater culture and of the league itself. Today, our guests are Rose Pearson mm -hmm. and Bill Newberry, who are the founders of the Circle Theater. And they are also lifetime achievement winners from the Live Theater League Awards. So welcome, Bill Thank and you. Rose. We're so happy you can be here today. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, how did, well, let's start with, let's start with you, Rose. How did theater become a part of your world? Is it something that you grew up with as a child and always wanted to do, or, or what happened for you? Well, I would say that the two influential forces for me were the ones that we encouraged to be influential with their children. It was my father, oh. who loved Shakespeare, loved opera. Uh, when he was cleaning house, he would sing Gilbert and Sullivan. Huh. We would sit at the kitchen table and read Shakespeare over the table. Uh, and then a teacher at school, who was our drama teacher, Mrs. Foster, used to be on the hall watch. And whenever I went by, she said, you look so serious, you look so serious. I'm going to give you a point against you every time you come around and you're not smiling. And so every time I went around the hall, I know Miss Foster was waiting and I go, <laughs> and, then, and then go back. So I learned to smile. It really changed my personality. Oh, that's So great. a teacher and a parent were very influential and we hope more of those people will be doing the same in years to come. Absolutely. So where were you living at the time? Where did you grow up? I grew up in the Texas Panhandle, Oh. up by Amarillo in Canyon, Texas. Okay. That's where the Paladera Canyon is, if you don't recognize yes. the name. Yes, yes. A small but proud town. <laughs> <laughs> With some uh, honorable and notable Thank citizens. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was so small, they actually relied on myself and a few other high schoolers to come and be in the show. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So you did theater in high school? Yes. And did you act? Were you producing, directing? Oh, I was the actress. Oh, you were the actress. I was the actress. Do you remember your first high school show? I think it was Cheaper by the Dozen. Excellent. Excellent. I can't remember who I played that. I'm trying to think. <laughs> and you went to college after that? Yes, I did. I had sort of a backwards college career. A lot of people go overseas to Europe for their junior year. I went for my freshman and sophomore year. And where did you go? <laughs> I went to Paris. 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 Gay yes. Paris. Paris. <laughs> yes. Gay Paris. Five days after I graduated from high school, I was in Paris. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you studied there or you, mm -hmm. and at where, where in Paris? Well, it you? sounds so exotic, but I went to the Sorbonne. You did yes. go to the Sorbonne. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Really Wonderful. dipped into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you study theater there, or what was your major? French, French civilization. French. Mm -hmm. You studied French. Yes. And then you came back, and where did you go? I did my last two years at the University of Austin in Texas. In Texas. So I graduated from Austin. You're a long one. <laughs> Should I show it to that camera? Or? Either I better way. have the right fingers. Do yes. <laughs> And, um, and did you do any theater down there, or when did theater start to no, come back uh, into your world? One of my parents encouraged me, but he died when I was very young. Oh. And the other parent did not want me to go into theater. <laughs> so uh, I was doing other things throughout that time. And uh, we had the idea that she was a very bright businesswoman. And so whatever part of me ended up being into the business side, that is her uh, oh. contribution to the whole. And we were going to go to Brazil and import things from Brazil to Texas. And so I needed to learn Portuguese to do that. Oh. And so I actually ended up majoring in Portuguese. And <laughs> did you ever go to Brazil? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get a fellowship to Portugal. Uh huh. So it worked out. So you did get to Portugal? Yes. And how long were you there? For a year? Or? Um, I was there for a summer. When I went over, oh, I, we didn't get to that part. 
Uh, well, yes, when I was in France. Uh -huh. Uh, I was there and then in London, so for a total of two years. And during that time, I went to Portugal during the summer. Ah. So, which was very nice because when they give you these Gulbenkian fellowships, they uh, count where you're coming from. So when I applied, I said I was an American. So they gave me the fellowship from the United States, which was the biggest fellowship. And I was just an hour away in London. <laughs> <laughs> so I had all this money from the fellowship. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And th after that, you came back. Mm -hmm. um, after, well, I was, uh, I was in Paris, like I said, during my freshman and sophomore year. Mm -hmm. Came back and went to UT, graduated from there. Mm -hmm. And then I went to London after that. So uh, it was another year over in London. Yeah. But I actually graduated um, in 69, so I had to hold back and stay in the country and then go over to London. I and see. we stayed there for about two years. Excellent, excellent. That was with my first husband. Uh -huh. Sorry, Bill. I miss Bob. I miss Bob. <laughs> so you had a first husband? I had a first husband. And, and where did you guys meet? Uh, the first husband uh -huh. and I? Uh, husband. We met in Paris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the city of love. There you go. <laughs> so you had, you were with him for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and what brought you back to Texas? How did you wind up in Fort Worth? Um, Gee, you know, it's so long ago, it's getting hard to remember. Uh, what brought me back to Texas? Well, oh, just came back and I don't know. That's a missing part of my life. Well, I'll have to look that John, up. John mm -hmm. got a job in Dallas at Republic Bank or whatever bank was there. Right. You ended up in Dallas and so we that. start. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. This is the dates, man. <laughs> if you have any problem with dates, he'll know everything. Um, <laughs> yes, John was looking for work in the States and he had several interviews to do. And we made a pact that we would drive all the way across the states from New York to San Francisco to find his job. And do you know where we ended up? Texas! Texas! <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I landed here in the beautiful city. Well, at the time, don't tell anybody it was Dallas, but I made it to Fort Worth, so okay. everything is good. <laughs> We're okay with that. You crossed the county line. I made it. <laughs> you got into Tarrant. Yes. Yes, and Fort Worth. Wonderful. And somehow you wound up getting into theater here? Yes, I mean at the time it was really more of a fun thing, a hobby I guess to do, but uh, when I first got to Dallas I was encouraged to act in films and things like that oh, mm -hmm. and so uh, I joined a talent agency and I worked in the talent a agency for probably four or five years. What agency was it? It was the Joy Wise agency oh, at the Joy time. Wise. Mm -hmm. I think she's retired now. Yes. And uh, so I sort of got the thirst for theater back again, and I went back and volunteered after hours to do theater. Oh. And the bug bit. There you are. <laughs> yes. I was doing copywriting in public relations. That was my so field at the time. I bet that's what came in handy in the future. Yes, there. yes. it all came in handy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew words, Bill knew numbers. And now let's talk to Bill a little bit and catch up. Where well, are you from? Um, Texas. You are from Texas, yes. this I've been, area? I've been in Fort or? Worth since 1960. Okay. Uh, so moved here with my folks then. Uh, went to Richland High School, oh. TCU. Okay. So I've been here the whole time. And were you in theater or what, what yeah. area were you um, in? We lived in, in North Richland Hills and so, mm -hmm. you know, my mother, I was a shy kid, my mother said, why don't you go take a speech class? And in speech class they did a play and I was in the play and that was pretty much it. So that all through high school and then at TCU. There you go. Mm -hmm. And when did you two meet? Uh, doing a show. <laughs> and where was that? Oh, it was at the Scott Theater. At the Scott uh, Bill Theater. Bill Garber directed us in Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, okay. In 19, hmm, one time ago. 78? 80, 78. 78. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was 78. 78, yeah. yeah. 78. And that's where we met. Fantastic. He was Mitch and I was Blanche. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. And then um, we started working together, and I was in the show that Rose directed, and then we moved, well, this is more into the circle theater's realm, but I guess we'll keep Go going ahead. there, because that's yeah, where our lives sure, really collide. We, we, um, we did a show at the Scott under Bill Garber. He let us do a show in the Scott, too. Mm -hmm. We were looking for another place to move that, so we moved it to the Kell Street Cafe, which is over in the Westcliff Shopping Center at the time. So uh, tell me... Uh, say that one more time for me. The, the well, what is it? Bill Garber was opening up the Scott Two, the studio space yes. for people to come in and direct. So Rose did a show there called "Who's Happy Now" by Oliver Haley. I was in it, 
It was very successful, and when it was over, you know, we had a short time in the Scott too. So we looked for another place to take it, so we took it over to the Kell Street Cafe, which is long gone now, but it was in the Westcliff Shopping Center. That's so over by TCU? It is. Um, mm -hmm. Not far, not far. Mm -hmm. So we, we did this, that show there in the, in the cafe, and then we did a Christmas show, I think. And then we did bus stop after that, and then we couldn't think of any more cafe shows to do. So <laughs> it was environmental theater over we there. Up, we ended yes. up looking around for another space, and we found one on the Blue Bonnet Circle. And so wow. we ended up naming ourselves Circle Theater because that's where we landed was on a circle. So in Blue Bonnet Circle mm -hmm. is where you defined the name Circle Theater. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And uh, who else was involved in, in that process of creating wow. the origins of Circle Theater? Well, there was my father, Wilson Newberry. Um, there was Beverly Brown, Debbie Brown. Joe Berryman. Joe Berryman. Wow. Um, <laughs> now, so you are yeah, really going no, back. No. Um, Beverly. I said Beverly Brown. You did say Beverly yeah, Brown. Two Brown girls, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, June Johnson, mm -hmm. Claudia Binge. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Then you go to the early years. I'm trying to think of the ones that actually came and hammered and uh -huh. uh, did the whole clean us up and get us going. Uh, I just mentioned the place that we moved to was an old Mexican restaurant. Oh. And mm -hmm. so we learned how to clean gas traps. Uh, yeah. Not the restaurant. Oil traps. And <laughs> Oil traps. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. And uh, one place had this enclosed window booth, and we discovered that's where they made the tortillas. And so when you went to the restaurant, you could sit there and watch them slap the tortillas on the grill. And that became our light booth. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so coincidentally, there was always something off on stage right <laughs> that had a window. So the light booth could look and see what was going on on stage. <laughs> and if we had to cover the light booth, we would cough on cue. And that meant, this is Q13. <clears throat> and they would do Q13. <laughs> That's great. And I think, uh, I think Joe remembers some of those days, too. Yes, yeah. Joe Brown. Yes, mm -hmm. he came in and was one of our early guest directors. He was. Wonderful. Wonderful. Joe Brown, he of Texas Wesleyan University, in case somebody doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, our legacy project is for the people who don't know. So it's great. It's really great to understand uh, how this is all coming together. Let's go back a little bit to, uh, back to streetcar and mm. bill garber yes. and the scott theater as a as a resource um tell us a little bit about bill and and how all of that worked if you know anything about the origins of the scott theater no not really um, or how bill got involved well i do know he was he started on uh, i think it was sylvania boulevard mm -hmm. it was sylvania. and had a community theater over there and um they were very enthusiastic. He was just like the rest of us were at that age, you know, in the 20s and ready to go make the impossible happen. And so he collected a group of enthusiasts for theater of all ages who were very devoted to him and his talents. And the opportunity came up that a well-to-do businessman named William Edrington Scott, I can't say it, William Edrington, Edrington Scott. Scott. Um, there's a G in there if they could find it. Yep. Um, dedicated some of his will to money to fund the arts in a building that was to be erected for theater and a museum only. And so Bill Garber's talents came into being by having Fort Worth Theater find a home in that building. Oh. And it's a beautiful place. It was a beautiful home for many years. I remember when I came over from Dallas, Dallas. and uh, visited, <laughs> I was amazed at wonderful auditorium that the people in Fort Worth had. Right. It was a professional level theater. And I said, oh, we don't have anything like this in Dallas. This is fantastic. And so a lot of us who have gone on to start our own theaters, as we did, came from Bill Garber's flock mm -hmm. at the Scott Building. Right. And at that time, uh, Casa Manana was the only major... Those were the two that were going at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During our childhood, well, during my childhood, mm -hmm. that was the two, that was the two theaters uh -huh. in town. So, about when did Fort Worth Theater start? Oh, early 60s, early something like that. I think mm -hmm. they moved to the Scott Building in the mid to late 60s. Because okay. my first show there was in 69, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure if he started as early on Sylvania as 50s, late 50s, but mm -hmm. it was somewhere in that area, uh -huh. late 50s, 60s. Yeah. 
Uh, great, great. Let's <clears throat> jump back to Circle itself, the theater itself. Um, were, when you were at Blue Bonnet Circle, was that theater in the round, or was it a thrust or proscenium, or what was the, the format? Mm, sort flexible? Of, sort of, no, no, it wasn't yes, flexible. Yes, so, do you want to say? <laughs> it, was, it, was more, it was more like, well, proscenium, you had the stages over here and the seatings over here, and yeah, yeah, yeah I guess proscenium would be the close. I wouldn't call what we had a proscenium arch by any chance, but, <laughs> any stretch of the imagination, but... Yeah, it was. Well, uh, in Texas, you have to, you, if you're a nonprofit organization, you have your commercial theater and you have your nonprofit theater. Yes. Uh, it doesn't mean that one theater makes more money than the other. It's just a different way of setting up your theater. And we came in as a nonprofit, so the government of Texas requires that you have a name that no other nonprofit has in Texas. And so we went through all kinds of highfalutin names <laughs> that sounded very theatrical. And everything sounded very theatrical, and so we thought, well, we're on a circle. Let's try circle. Let's call it Circle Theater. Mm -hmm. And we laughed and said, do you think in the whole state of Texas there's not one circle theater? And there wasn't. And there wasn't. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So that led to this misunderstanding that we were a theater in the round, which we were not. And we were more a theater in the uh, arena, uh, horseshoe. Uh, no. <laughs> we are now, sort of. Um, we're now in the horseshoe. The thrust, but... but Back then, we just had a small theater facing the stage. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So we had no idea that future things would happen in our little circle theater that everybody identified with a figure shape, a, a circle figure shape, ended up being circle in a square, at <laughs> Sundance Square. Uh-huh, So uh -huh. between circle on Blue Bonnet Circle and circle in Sundance Square, that's where we landed. Yes, yes we've got the geometry down yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you have a particular f uh, foundation or perspective on the kind of theater you wanted to produce? What, what in particular? Wow. Did you have a unique thing or just anything that could... Uh, oh, the Magnolia, absolutely. Could, could that's work. One of those, that's one of those things that's kind of evolved over, the, over time. Mm -hmm. We started out one way and we've kind of evolved into something to where we are now. Um, how would you say when we started out, we were doing? Well, really, we were doing we, newer published scripts at that point in time. Right, we were we were the edgy theater in town, uh -huh. and uh, we did that for a long time. I would categorize the stage west at that time was doing the classics and musicals, with newer theater, but that was their specialty. And then as time progressed, and Amphibian came on later in the history of theater here, they are very much interested in the new theater and the edgy theater. And we sort of migrated to be more interested in playwrights that haven't been produced here, but what they do tend to write are really wonderful stories. So we're into supporting a contemporary playwright who tells a really good story. Okay, that's, that's a very clear mission, mm -hmm. a very clear vision. So uh, tell me, um, what happened from Blue Bonnet Circle? Where did you go? We were there seven years, uh -huh. uh, and it got to a point where we needed to expand and do something. So we started looking around, uh, and the south side of Fort Worth came to us and said, come over and take a look at Magnolia. Uh, we're just you know, trying to develop this area. We would like to have some entertainment. We'd like to have arts uh, in the area. So we went over, took a look, and there was this beautiful building it was built as a Masonic Lodge and ended up in one of its incarnations being a funeral home, but it's uh, on the corner of Fifth and Magnolia. And so we uh, looked at the fourth floor, and so we took the fourth and the fifth floor, that beautiful 20-foot ceilings, great architecture, and we moved over there for seven years. Now, was that uh, fourth floor, did you say? Fourth floor. Did you have... Uh, yeah, we did. We, it was a passenger elevator. Was okay. That was all we had. It wasn't a freight elevator. You had a pa passenger. So, thanks to... Wesleyan, Joe Brown again. Uh -huh. We had a lot of wonderful students that were very young and very healthy and could <laughs> climb the fire escape with lots of stuff. Stuff. So they climbed up four, four flights on the fire escape to bring stuff into the building. Wow. And after that was done, then we had to either bring stuff up on the fire escape or through the stairwell, or we had to cut things down to no more than seven feet to get in the passenger elevator. Uh, yeah. So it was pretty restrictive as far as what we could do over yeah. there. My best had, memory of that is when we had to bring in how much dirt oh, to cover the stage. Oh, we had a show called More Fun Than Bowling. And the, the show basically takes place in a cemetery. Mm. So we had to have all this dirt brought in to make graves with. So we had... A, 
A stage well, covered with every, dirt. <laughs> everything, everything has always happened the way it should. We had a young man in the show then that was playing the lead, and he said, you know, I know this place that has some really clean dirt. And we said, what? And he said, yeah, it, it rained a lot, and the water has sifted through the dirt, and it's got all the impurities, and it's really clean. So we got a truckload of clean dirt, and wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow, we took it up the elevator, elevator. and dumped it on the stage, and yeah, then wow. we had a stage covered in dirt. Do you have photos of these, any of these uh, productions? Somewhere, yes, sure. somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. His retribution for making that suggestion about clean dirt is he had to be buried in it. Oh. So when the audience comes in, they see three graves on the stage. Three people have been buried there. And he was in the middle grave. And so I did my pre-show speech, who some of have been known, have been known to say, sometimes it was a little too long. <laughs> and so he said, Rose, it's hot in there. Can you cut down the speech? <laughs> and I said, but it's, a, it's our time to sell season tickets. I have to tell them. So he had one straw to breathe air oh. through until the show started. And then after a few pages of dialogue, he comes out of the grave and everybody was absolutely mm -hmm. Yes. Amazed. Yes. He'd been buried there all the way through. Wow. <laughs> wow. What a what a commitment, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to <laughs> to the art. Yeah. What else was uh, interesting that happened at that Magnolia space? Wow. Well, I will say, by the way, mm -hmm. we were not looking forward to getting rid of all that dirt. I mean, anything equally as hard as bringing it up <laughs> was yes. taking it down. And so I made a pre-show announcement and offered, if anybody needs some clean dirt. It's yours. Come and get it. And people came. Mm -hmm. Loaded up the trucks with dirt. And That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And got rid of it for us. <laughs> excellent. An excellent way to serve the arts. Yes. <laughs> Receive clean fill. And recycling. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> and then what happened from there? You, you, how did you well, we, move on from there? It was an unfortunate time because what happened is when we moved over there, was about the same time that the first recession hit and the real estate market just tanked. Uh, so it was a struggle. Uh, the businesses over there weren't developing, people weren't moving in like they, were, like they thought they were going to. Right. So it became a real struggle and after seven years we came to the conclusion that if we were there another year we didn't think we would be in existence. So we had to start looking at other places. And that leads into where were we going to go? Well, about that time in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the city had a bond election coming up for the arts, to build for the arts. They were talking about building a 700-seat auditorium next to Casa. They were talking about maybe building two black box studios on the lawn outside of Scott Theater. Um, that evolved into being, well, maybe build, building two black box theaters on top of the Woolworth Building, which is down here on the corner of Houston and, uh, and Forth. Mm -hmm. So all of this was going on at this time, and we were looking around thinking, oh, this would be perfect to be a part of it. Well, they wanted Jubilee and Stage West were also part of that discussion. And that's really how the three of us actually got together and started talking as a group of theaters which turned into the Live Theater League. Well, meantime, bond election failed. So that went nowhere. So Jubilee talked to the Basses down here and they were able to find a, sp a space over on Main Street. Well, they first came to us and said, would you be able to share this space? And so I looked at sharing it with Jubilee, and it just, you know, it would, have, it would have been hard for them to share the space. And since they were down here first and really put their initiative into finding it, we backed off and said, no, that's, that's really space for Jubilee and not for Circle Ant Jubilee. And so they said, well, is there anything else? And we said, well, we'll take a look and see what you got. Uh, so we, we looked at space on top of the Whataburger, which was over here on the corner. Uh -huh. That would have been really nice about 8 o'clock at night having the smell of grease and hamburgers coming up, so we said no on that. <laughs> and they said, well, we've got this basement space. Uh, so we came over and we looked at this and we thought, well, the ceiling height is terrible, but there's 8,000 square feet down here. We can do something with this. So we got creative, took some ceiling out, and we've been here 22 years now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And of course, Sundance Square itself has yes. gone oh, yeah. through an, an amazing yeah. revitalization Absolutely. and, uh, Absolutely. and stuff. It's, it's yeah, a great our place season to be. tickets went through the roof. We've yep. just done very well yeah. here. Now, um, those early meetings, uh, and I've, I've heard Caravan of Dreams being, you know, mentioned. Um, do you, meetings held there or gatherings or something? Do you have any? 
memories or recollections I of remember that, the ones or? at Stage West, because they were on Vickery at that time. Okay. Their, their first incarnation on Vickery. Mm -hmm. And I remember having meetings there in the, um, in the uh, cafe area. Do you remember any of Caravan? Well, when the bond election ended that Bill was referring to, mm -hmm. I'll just go back a little bit. Sure. Um, the question came up, we've actually been talking to each other, which hadn't been going on before. We were all in our little world. And so we said, well, this is the time to invite others in or just walk away and, and not worry about it, just think about our own theaters. And so, uh, Bill included, we all decided that we would like to open this up. I mean, Bill Garber, not Bill. Bill Garber, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and ask the other theaters that were in town at that time, would they like to do something with the concept that it just happened with us and seemed to be a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So we sent word out to the other theaters for them to respond, and everybody responded very positively. Mm -hmm. um, for some reason at that time, we started meeting at Caravan of Dreams. I'm not really sure why. Well, the reason was when this bond election failed, Jerry Russell at Stage West needed to get out of the space he was in because they were getting ready to build I-30 at that time. Mm -hmm. So his first move was down to Caravan of Dreams. I so see. they shared that space uh, mm, with, right. um, I can't remember the name, what's their name? Four-day four weekend. Four day weekend? So they shared that space, uh, and so that's why we ended up meeting there. With Four Day Weekend, which is an improvisation... Improvisation of comedy group. Yes. Comedy. And, and was, they're still there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and there was also Tex, uh, Texas State? Texas Theater? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Texas Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't know that. Okay. Out of SMU, <laughs> okay. so I don't know about so anyway, that. We'll yes, we did have I guess we did have meetings there because uh huh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was happening. And so Bill Garber was there. Um, Mel Dacus was Mel Dacus mm -hmm. around Mel, Mel Dacus or? was involved in that for us. Uh huh. And this is jumping several years ahead. Uh -huh. um, he was in the first production that we did in this location at Sundance Square. Oh. Uh, the Golden Shadows Old West Museum, written by a Star Telegram editor, I believe. Michael Blackman. Michael Blackman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if Mel did many other shows after that, just a few before he passed away. So we were very honored, but Mel was most instrumental with Casa Mignano. Okay. That's the theater that he helped to get started. He really drove that. Yeah. But by the time the Live Theater League was going, uh, Mel had left, Bud Franks, who came in after him, had left, and it was, who was it after Bud? Who was it that was at the table, was it? Ben Kaplan. Ben Kaplan was there. There was one before Ben, I thought. Anyway, so uh, I bought, Mel, Mel was already out of Casa uh -huh. at that time yeah. when the theater formed. But yes, uh, Casa was a part of it too. They came to some of the meetings too. And what about Hip Pocket? Was Hip Pocket uh, part of this? Um... Not the original three, but they certainly came in to the meetings when I'm it was all sure up and up. Were they in operation at the time of the bomb? Yes, they actually were. Okay. Yes, they're older than we they're are. They're in their they 40 are. I thought they took a, yeah. a sabbatical or something yeah, for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, when we were building a Circle Theater, one of my fondest memories of Deanne and, and Johnny, uh, you know, we were the little theater that knew nothing. We knew some people that knew something, but <laughs> we didn't know anything. And um, Deanne talked to me on the phone one day, and I said, I just want to know, how, how is it being a producing director? What do you think? And she said, run away <laughs> quickly. You don't want to do this. And she told me all of the horror stories. And she said, if you still want to do it, call us. And so I called her one day and I said, we still want to do it. And she said, Johnny and I will be over there. What do you need? And so that night, Johnny and Deanne walked in with their hammers and their sewing machine and they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's so great. they were very uplifting and very supportive to us. Excellent. We appreciated that. Let's talk about the league a little bit um, as an organization. Do you remember how it continued to evolve or unfold? and? How did it at the actually very, at the organize? Very, at the very beginning, it was just like um, it was like we met once a, once a month, once every two months, something like that, and we basically just sat around and exchanged ideas with each other. Um, suppose Jerry came up with an idea for a problem that he had solved, he would share that with everybody else. Or if we had a problem we were trying to solve, we would open it up for discussion, or we would take something into the meeting that we had discovered. So it was more like a sharing of ideas uh, in the original 
concept of, of the And lamenting the state of theater in the 80s. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> we had that in common. It was, it was a tough time. Yeah. And, and uh, lamenting the state of theater and the conditions and the challenges, how does that serve us as producers of, of theater? I mean, clearly it does. Oh. The, the league is, uh, I, you know, some wondering mm -hmm. uh, somehow that collegiality, just misery loves company, <laughs> uh, just the, the, the common bond that, of the passion that mm -hmm. unites us all yes. and, uh, and just being able to say, uh, and someone going, I know what you mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Well, I think uh, for me, maybe it's not a positive thing to say, but it is in a humanitarian way. I think theater people take on too much. They just want to save the world. And so when we formed the organization, immediately everybody had a wonderful idea for some project that we should do. And it took a long time to realize that we were all producers doing projects of our own. But uh, we did work, I think, on a lot of noteworthy projects. Uh, one of them was the high school playwriting project that was produced through Circle to begin with, and then it traveled uh, to, I think, Live Theater League after that, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. And then it came to Fort Worth Theater and then back to Circle again. So it really was a circle, and that is an outreach project that we do, and, and it's just so rewarding to get the young people of today interested in playwriting. Tell us a little bit more of how that's structured and who some of the people do do have, have okay. been uh, with, uh, that have been involved in that. Okay. Are we um, talking about the high school or are we talking about live theater? Later? The high, the high, high school. school. Just to, uh, uh, well, first of all, one. Larry Boston, who was at Eastern Hills Drama Department at that time, mm -hmm. came to me and said, we want a scholarship from the Star-Telegram. And uh, they, they have given us this money to encourage our student playwrights. And we would mm -hmm. like a theater with professional actors to come in and, and support this project with their actors and their directors. So we volunteered to cast the show and, and have a director for the show. And we worked with the students to present it. Even at that time, we even had theater critics come in and review their shows. Wow. So we tried to do it as much as possible on a professional platform. And we, uh, we gave the students edits that might help them in writing a stronger show. And then we presented it as a public reading that was free to the public. Uh, and we went on a few years like that, and then Circle was caught up in moving and mm -hmm. remodeling and going to different parts of town, and then it went to the Live Theater League. And I think they established with Natalie Galp, someone who was on the Stage West um, uh, staff, to reorganize it and have it through them. And that went on for a few years, and then it went to, we, d we decided that as a Live Theater League, we needed to buckle down and look at our own projects instead of spend our energies on these multitude of projects we were doing, the high school playwright being one of them. So the Fort Worth Theater then took it over, and that was one of their projects before they eventually went out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, just before that happened, it came back to Circle to support it again, and here she lies. And we have had, this past season, we had 96 playwrights apply. We uh, offer scholarships to Texas Wesleyan University, to anyone that qualifies for that. We give cash stipends to the winners. We shouldn't say winners. We try to avoid that word, to the mm -hmm. finalists mm -hmm. and to their teachers to use in the classroom or however they please. Mm -hmm. And uh, we even had a couple of students that were enrolled in the French's Samuel French Play Service uh, directing project and they made honorable, honorable mention. So um, I think it's growing. I'd like to wave to Tim. Tim, come in here. <laughs> Tim, Tim Long is now handling it for Circle Theater. Uh -huh. He is the project director. Is that what we're calling you, Tim? Project director? That's a good title. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm project director. We called you something else. But anyway, we're real important. And uh, he and Kyle Montgomery on our staff are, and Connie Witt Lambert, who has a playwriting class at Texas Wesleyan University. Mm -hmm. And part of the project is once the teachers and their students apply and send us the uh, script. We send it out to theater people that we've selected to read the scripts. It's all anonymous, so nobody knows who what, wrote what script from what school. And we pick 20 scripts from that, the readers do, and send it over to Texas Wesleyan and to Connie Witt Lambert's 
class in playwriting. They read them and they select the finalists in the project, the 20 scripts. Wow. Well, no, actually our readers select the 20 scripts and they send it to the playwriting class. And from those 20 scripts, they select four finalists and four semifinalists. And then it comes to Circle to present it to the public as a reading. And so it has a good life. The, the playwriting class makes edits, the students improve their plays, and it has the final showing here at Circle. And we thought, let's let the students talk. For a lot of times in the past, we would just hand them their, their awards and they would go sit down. And I said, let's let them talk. And we thought, well, will they be too shy? Will they just shuffle around? They are so good about speaking about their feelings. And they would just go on so enthusiastically. It really brings that back the love that we feel for theater. Do you see a trend in the topics that the, the uh, high school students are writing about? Do you see any uh, evolution over the years or topics? What were our topics this year? Do you remember? You know, it's, <laughs> they're doing, they, we, digital age is definitely something okay. that's a little trendy. Yeah. They've come, the, the scripts are now much more into the digital age. So the scripts uh, are much more about the digital age now and... Uh, and kind of a cynical world, too. They're not happy scripts for the most part. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. A lot of the scripts we read in general are not, not no. happy scripts. <laughs> Professional playwrights aren't really happy, really happy either. either. No. <laughs> Very the hardest thing in theater to find is a comedy, a good comedy. A good comedy is really hard what to find. What everyone wants to see is a good comedy. <laughs> uh huh, uh huh. Yes, to relieve us yes. of our anxieties in the. Right. And as theaters, we try to serve the playwright. We're especially a circle theater. We feel the playwright needs to be served. That is, that's an important. Uh, part of what, what our mission is. But we also need to serve our audience. And last but not least, the reviewers. Yes. And each of them wants something entirely different. Yeah. So it's a challenge sometimes. Yeah, yeah. What do you think has been the most favorite uh, aspect of your, your passion of raising this, this baby that's now in its 35th season? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> It's hard to pick a favorite. <laughs> well, mine is definitely the playwrights. The yes. playwrights, yes. cultivating um, the playwrights. Getting to know them, yeah, it was a high point. Yeah. I think that's an important service that we do. And there's a saying that the regional theaters are now Broadway across America. Because the newer playwrights, especially those that don't do musicals, are really looking for a place to be seen because the big cities can't afford to mount the smaller play. So we're, we're trying to be a part of that service to the mm -hmm. uh, growth of modern plays. Yeah, that's, that's excellent and important, uh, important work. Well, we've established it to the point uh, that the playwrights come here, they watch the shows. A lot of our productions are second and third productions. Mm -hmm. So they come and workshop their plays through the shows they see here. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, we're just really proud of that. I mean, we have a lot of contact. We also, as a, something we started last year, we Skype with each playwright of our season. Oh, okay. So the cast and the crew have a chance to talk to them personally. Excellent, excellent. It's uh, nice that we have, we can use the digital technology exactly. to <laughs> strengthen the relationship between the writer mm -hmm. and the, the cast and the director. And well, more and more, you know, theater and, and the, the digital, di digital age are joining forces. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, can you imagine ever having the actual ability to Skype out live productions, uh, performances to people who are not able to get here physically? It's you know, if we could, we'd think about it, but we're so restricted in what we do because okay. we're a union house that we can't oh, even okay. think about doing that. I see, yes. Well, speaking of union house, mm -hmm. um, can you talk about um, what that means in terms of the uh, quality, uh, a long-lived theater such as Circle, working from a volunteer and community organization and building to an incredible facility like you have, and then uh, being able to employ 
uh, talent on a, an actor's equity contract. Um, what has that meant to the theater? And we have a theater fly. Hang on. <laughs> um, Why don't you talk about that? You're our equity expert. <laughs> well, I'm not the equity expert, but uh, yes. Oh, I thought you were saying something. <laughs> um, That's Joe Brown. In case you wonder, who's off off the uh, camera? <laughs> I think um, uh, opening up and being an equity house has just increased our ability to cast more than we did in the, in the past. Uh, what happened was when we started 35 years ago, the people that we're using now were what you call an amateur status. They were not an equity actor. But over time, there's been more equity houses. There's been a lot of work in Dallas. So a lot of the people that we want to use in our shows have become equity. So it was just kind of a natural transition for us to go from non-equity to a par partial equity to a full equity house that we are now. Uh, we're using a lot of the same actors that we've always used, but they're taking it, more, they're, they're more of a professional now, and so it just kind of goes that way. You know, they've got more experience, they're professional, so do we, so. Yeah. And, and I, that was not very good. That was not a very good answer, Rose, so. You, you, no, I think you did just no, fine. I, <laughs> Uh, I, I like it. I personally, I, I am a big uh, union mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, performer uh, and and believer from many many years in this industry as a performer. Um, the value and the protections and things like that that the uh, union provides, and I know that from a producing standpoint, it's a real choice. And uh, the value from the union's perspective is to be able to provide you with the best actors available right. and to see, uh, I mean, I love the shows that you put on here and the quality of the talent is excellent and I think that's reflected in that relationship, so. Well, I'd like to bring up yeah. something. Do you, can you focus somewhere else in this room? Or is that too difficult with your camera? Like where? Right there, on that picture. We did get a photo of it. We did. Did you get one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Excellent. So that is Ann L. Rhodes, who uh, we have a status here at the theater called the founding director, which was originally the founding directors, Bill, myself, and his father, Wilson. And did we get it? No. We have a fly. We have a, a theater fly here. A fly and in the paint. No. As time went by, uh, we added other people that we felt were so much a part of the fabric of Circle. Uh -huh. And we added Ann Rhodes on very early because without her, Circle could never have gone equity. It's a very expensive proposition mm -hmm. to do and we support it thoroughly, but frankly, it can put a theater out of business. Yes. So, uh, especially a theater the size of Circle, we have 125 seats, and when you tally up what uh, the salary for an equity player and the health, sorry, <laughs> and the pension costs are, yes. it's it's a major part of everybody's budget. Yes. But we wanted, we felt that this fly should really go away. <laughs> we, we do feel this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll do our best. We felt that you know actors are always kind of the underpaid ones in the business, and. We don't want to see them having to travel to other cities to do their craft. So in our own small way, sometimes it's a struggle, we wanted to take on that challenge and provide those benefits to actors. Keep them here. Yes. <laughs> and you as go. you mentioned, they do help with the quality of the theater that we're presenting. Yes. Yes. And the reason we could do it is Anne was a believer in equity also you, and in it being that. a union house. And so she graciously underwrote us for a few years to be able to hire equity. Uh, which was a huge help getting it started. Yeah. And it was a huge loss, of course, when we lost Anne a few years ago, too. So. Yes, yes. So, uh, Anne L. Rhodes, actually, we have the Live Theater League has named um, our philanthropic award in her honor. And um, I'm sorry, I never got a chance to meet her because no. uh, um, she must have been quite, quite a lady. She <laughs> Love well, she theater. Was, she was the one well to do person that I know of personally, that actually put theater above all other arts. Wow. <laughs> We're not usually ranked with ballet and symphony and opera. We're sort of the every man's art. And most uh, society wealthy people go towards those arts, which certainly we're glad for them. But she was the one that championed theater. Wonderful, wonderful. 
So what has happened here in this space that couldn't have happened in any other space? Besides the nuts and bolts of getting an audience down to see us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're surrounded, I mean, I mean, we're surrounded with restaurants, so you mm -hmm. automatically have yes. go, to the, go see a show, go out afterwards mm -hmm. or before to a restaurant. That's ready made for us. And the uh, marketing for Sundance Square. Mm -hmm. Is. They always include theater yeah. and the arts in their mm -hmm. marketing. Mm -hmm. And the location. Everybody knows where Sundance Square is. Yes, yes. So that's great. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great thing. Um, let's talk a little bit, let's bounce back to the league itself. Um, and, uh, well, there's two things I want, want to talk about. One is, um, at, actually, let's stay with Circle. I'd like to ask you just about your to talk more about your theater's relationship with the academic environment because I know you have a close relationship with some of the local colleges and how that has fed you know the the talent pool and material and resources well, did we mention those students from Texas Wesleyan that were loading all of our things? <laughs> yes, yes. you did. You did. Uh, <laughs> it, it really is much more extensive. I think a lot of people are kind of surprised at how closely the theaters associate and help each other because that's not a common thing you see in cities. But even more so, we also have a close relationship with academic theater in this town. And there's a lot of cross-fertilization. So it could be anything from we encourage and enjoy having directors that are on the faculty at these uh, uh, schools around us to come over and mm -hmm. direct at our theater. And in turn, it also seems to help them with their tenure and other things at their mm -hmm. school. Um, everything cross-fertilization-wise, it can't hurt anybody. It really doubles our uh, possibilities. And we did enlarge the membership of the Life Theater League to include the academic at-large members. So uh, presently, to my best memory, we have Texas Wesleyan University, we have Texas Women's University in Denton, uh, Texas Christian University, am I missing anybody? Do you have anybody from UTA now? You had the Gops, Gops, Natalie, for... Not um, really UTA, okay. although that's an idea, might be able to do something So it that. is open, okay. <laughs> and then Tarrant County College. Like TCC. Yeah. Yes, yes, TCC and... Uh, and when Deanne was out at Weatherford, we had what was that? Uh, Deanne because Simons. Because there's a lot of uh, theater people that also teach. Yes. And work on the faculties there. Yes. So there's, there's, it's just one can't do without the other. <laughs> and I've noticed I've been in some live theater league meetings where um, members are invited to come to one of the academic um, organizations and present, uh, come in as a guest artist, a guest mm -hmm. teacher, mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's, mm -hmm. so the league seems to provide a nice opportunity for that cross-fertilization you were talking about. One of the great things. What are some of the favorite things you've enjoyed about the league? About the league? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think first and foremost was we were talking to each other. I mean, you can be in this town for years and years and years and never talk to another producer mm -hmm. at that time. Uh -huh. And now we have a regular agenda where we do share ideas and um, help each other in any way that we can. Um, I, think, I think the league, well, really, I would say that's the most important thing. We network. We, we've had any number of worthwhile projects, more than we needed to have. <laughs> but the main thing is we foster that closeness mm -hmm. and, and can help each other. It makes it available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very unique and special thing. Yes. You know, Other cities don't have it. Doesn't doesn't really yeah. happen out there. I was speaking with a producer in Dallas, and he said it would never fly in Dallas. Yeah. So, <laughs> although they there has been some talk of uh, of getting some advice from us to support <laughs> the organization, I think we should start to wrap this up. Is there anything that um, you have on your bucket list for for theater or and what you know? or for the for circle or for the league or for the Sundance? Oh. Well, I just you wanted to, to say see. that uh, several years ago when uh, Joe was president and I was vice president of the Live Theater League, mm -hmm. uh, I had submitted the idea of archiving. 
and with all of these people at hand and all of this knowledge, and I have to say some of us slipping away, it's a good idea uh, to keep that secure. And, and I know I've heard from Tim that the League is reconsidering that idea. At the time it was first brought up, it didn't go anywhere, but mm -hmm. uh, we've collected materials, and, and I understand that there are other materials being collected, so I'm looking forward to seeing an archive of uh, what's been done through the Live Theater League. Excellent. Um, the original people that were involved in those early meetings around the bond issue are all gone except for us. Mm -hmm. So it's good to get this done now. Yes, well, <laughs> we are incredibly grateful that you were able to be available and for us to well, capture this. Well, thank you. This. I want to thank you for mm -hmm. what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Bill, very much. And thank you. Go to live theater. That's the deal. <laughs>